Hello, Grace Church family and friends. It's so good to be with you again today. We thank you for tuning in. We're excited about our time of worship that we have planned for today. And also, what's really exciting as well is that right after our worship time, my co-leader, Pastor Rodney Carter, is going to be bringing the message today. And it's going to be a message that will really inspire you in your faith. So I want to encourage you to stay tuned. Enjoy this time of worship. And I want to encourage you to enter in, whether you're uh, by yourself or with family and friends, just wherever you may be, just make sure that you just spend some time and just dedicate this time unto the Lord and allow him to minister to your heart as, as you honor him with lifting up your worship and, and praise unto him. So have an excellent time together here of our worship and then enjoy the rest of your day. God bless you so much. We'll see you real soon. Serve it all. 
deserve it all So with every breath that's in my lungs My heart cries out to you belongs The glory Through every loss or victory My soul will rise to only bring you glory With every breath that's in my lungs My heart cries out to you belongs the glory Through every lost soul
around your throne who can know your glory so high above you're slain for us you alone are worthy and the praise is yours and the praise is yours you're the one we bow before Reigning over us As we lift you up You will reign God of every moment Forever crown Exalted now You alone are holy And the praise is yours And the praise is yours You're the one we
to you only You alone are worthy God For you only Only you are worthy Well, good morning, Grace Church. We're so excited to worship with you this morning. Uh, uh, can you do me a favor? Share this uh, live service. Share this with your friends. Let everyone know uh, that we're live right here at Grace Church. I count it a privilege and an honor uh, to be able to stand with uh, you today uh, to proclaim to you God's word. I count it as a privilege and honor for, for this being my official Sunday uh, on staff here at Grace Church. I'm honored uh, to be able to serve at such a great church and to be able to serve alongside such a great leader of our pastor, Pastor Ray Sinsenig. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to get right into the Word of God. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, 1 Kings chapter 17, and we're going to dive right into God's Word together. It reads as this, Then the Word of the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Seraphath. As he arrived at the gate of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks and he asked her, would you please bring me a little water and a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God, I do not have a single piece of bread in the house. And I only have a handful of flour left in a jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal. Then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go ahead and do just what you said. But make a small, uh, make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord said. The God of Israel says, there will always be flour and oil left in your containers until the time of the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and oil left in the containers, just as the Lord promised through Elijah. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together around your word to to seek your face. And so, Father, we ask God that you speak to our hearts and our minds. God, allow someone to be saved today. Allow someone to be healed and experience your love. God, anoint our ears so we may hear what you're saying to us and anoint me afresh to proclaim your word. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. I would love to tag this text with this subject, Obey the Ridiculous, expect the miraculous. Yes, obey the ridiculous, expect the miraculous. Put that in the comments. Obey the ridiculous, expect the miraculous. You know, I, I, I'm reminded of growing up and uh, how my babysitter used to stress Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. She used to say, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Matter of fact, she actually got specific and she said, know what, Rodney? You need to obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And honor your mother and your father, which is the first commandment with a promise. I'm reminded every time I hear that scripture, I recognize that there was a reward for obeying your parents. But as I got a little older, I had chores. And yes, I had chores. And, and my, my job in the house was to clean my room and help my sister wash the dishes and take out the trash. Uh, and whenever I completed my chores, there's always an incentive. I received an allowance. But however, when I got around the age of 15 and 16, I, I found myself completing my chores and doing what my parents told me to do. But y'all started to see that there was no allowance. I I was getting a little older and I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, but I started to see that there was no allowance. So I got a little bold, y'all. I got bold and I said, you know what? I'm not going to do my chores. And y'all know what happened. I got reprimanded. I got a spanking. The Bible says, uh, spare the raw, spoil the child. So I 
truly want to tell you, I was not spoiled in that moment. I, I got a spanking. But as a result of that, I went and told my grandfather, I said, granddaddy, your son beat me. Your son gave me a spanking. And he said, why did your dad do that? I said, well, because I did not complete my chores. And the reason why I didn't do it was because I didn't get an allowance. My grandfather said, Rodney, you, you, need, you need to do your chores and do what your parents told you to do. Because the reality is, is you're always getting an incentive, but it may not be in the form you would like it to be in. He said, you have food on your table. You have clothes on your back. You're going to a private school. He said, you're being compensated, but not in the form you expected it to be. And one thing I realized that when we obey the ridiculous, we can expect the miraculous. So so here in our text today, we read of the Lord commanding the prophet Elijah, who was hungry and tired, to go to the village of Seraphath, which belongs to Sidon. And he said, I have commanded a widow to provide for you. So, So when he arrived at Zarephath, there was a widow gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, please bring me a cup of water. And as she was going to get the cup of water, he said, matter of fact, why are you going to go get that cup of water? I need you to please bring me some bread. And as we understand this text, we realize that during the time of our text, widows were exceptionally poor. They were, uh, they were poor in this particular text. But here we see this woman had no bread, but just a handful of flour and a little jar of oil. Here in our text today, the first thing we can observe is that there is a ridiculous command, a ridiculous command. Put that in the chats, a ridiculous command. Normally, when one uses the word ridiculous, you think of something silly or type of foolish gesture. Webster defines ridiculous as something absurd, outrageous, unbelievable, and laughable. But here we see something ridiculous. The prophet asks a widow for some bread, but yet he sees her condition. You see, sometimes God will often ask us to do some things we think we cannot do or what people limit us to do. This has to be one of the most ridiculous requests in this chapter. Because this woman was broken financially, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. She was hungry. She said, I only have enough for myself and my son, and we're going to eat and die. But what I did not understand, what I did not understand is that when the prophet asked for water, she was willing to give what she had available to get. But but when the prophet asked for bread, he said, I don't have any bread. I just have a handful of flour and a little jar of oil, which is the main ingredient for bread, which she was not willing to give. She said, I have just enough. She said, I have just enough. Can, Can I tell you something? That if you have a small amount that seems just enough, God can take that just enough and make it more than enough. Let me say that one more time. God can take your just enough and make it more than enough. Matthew 14 says Jesus was ministering to a crowd of over 5,000 people. They were hungry. And here comes a little boy who had just enough for his lunch. He had two fish and five loaves of bread. He gives it to Jesus and the disciple says, Jesus, this is only enough for a few people, not 5,000. But Jesus took what people thought was just enough and made it more than enough. I come to tell you that God can take your just enough and make it more than enough only when you give it to Jesus. As we, as we read of this woman complaining of not having enough to give the prophet, in verse 13, she, the prophet says, fear not. I, I'm a kind of sympathetic person. I'm, I, I have a very tender heart. And, and I don't understand why the prophet is telling this woman, fear not. She has a right to fear. She's hungry. She's poor. She feels like she's getting ready to die. There's, there's, there's a whole lot of rights to her feeling fearful. But the prophet says, fear not. And the Lord, as I was looking at this text, he took me back to verse 8 of this particular text. And it says, then the word of the Lord came. But look at this. In verse 13, the text says, fear not. But in verse 8, it says, then the word of the Lord came. The reason why she should not fear is because the word of the Lord came. I want to let you know is that God is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and he's the end. He's the first and he's the last. God's word is sure. And that's why we don't have to fear. Because the Bible says that he's not a man that he should lie. And nor is he the son of man that he should repent. 
So the prophet, the prophet says, fear not after hearing the widow's reason why she could not do what he asked of her. But, but now the prophet, after he, he gives her the first command, the second command, he puts a twist to it. He says, hey, can you give me the first slice? And that is understanding that was his first portion. And I come to understand that my brothers and sisters, one of our major impediments sometimes in receiving a ridiculous blessing or miraculous blessing is that sometimes we try to make sense of what God is doing in our lives. Sometimes we as believers want to make certain that when God gives us a word or whenever we, he shines light from the Bible, that we're able to understand it. Well, if understanding everything is your prerequisite for obeying the Lord, we might as well quit right now because God's vision is, is different from our vision. Our vision is obstructed by the placement of this world. And because of that, we're not going to always understand everything, but what he's asking us to do is respect respond in faith. So, so the first thing we see is that there is a ridiculous command. The second thing I see in the text is that after there is a ridiculous command, it continues with a ridiculous response in obedience. Put that in the chats. Put that in the chats. Ridiculous response in obedience. You see, obedience is the willing submission in order and instructions of one in authority. To obey God simply means to obey his statutes and his commandments. In order for me to follow God's purpose for my life, I have to obey him. I have to be willing to do what he says do. Because it's not hard to obey God because from creation we were designed to obey him. But the question is, are we willing to obey him? So, so, so you may say, Rodney, Rodney, why does it seem so difficult for us to obey God? Can I give you some reasons? Can I give you some reasons? Now, the first reason why it may seem difficult for us to obey God is because we may have some unsurrendered areas in our life that clashes with the word of God. In one way, we say, I'm going to obey God in this way, but I'm not going to give him the rights in this way. Okay, let me give you another one. It seems difficult for us to obey God when our obedience puts us at odds with people we believe we need acceptance and approval from. Sometimes acceptance and approval from others mean more important to us than obeying God. And sometimes it can get to the degree that we believe we need acceptance and approval from people that we'll compromise our obedience to God to get acceptance and approval from people who really don't even care about us. It seems difficult for us to obey God when we have low tolerance for short-term discomfort. Many times obeying God leads to short-term discomfort because the Bible tells us for these light afflictions, which is yet before a moment, are working for our so exceeding weight of glory. Lastly, it seems difficult for us to obey God when we entertain postponement as an acceptable option. In other words, it says, I'm going to get around to obeying God one of these days. And sometimes that can pacify our mind and can put us in a state of rebellion and disobedience. But let's look at the text. The text says here in verse 13, he says, when the prophet repeats himself, he puts a twist to it. The first time he asked her to bake a cake, he said, bake it for me. The second time he said, hey, can you bake a cake for me? Give me the first slice, then you can have a slice. Then the text indicates that she went. Let me say that one more time. The first time he said, hey, go bring me some bread. She said, I don't have any bread. The second time he said, bring me some bread. I will have the first slice, then you can have a slice. Then the text indicates that she went. Is it amazing that sometimes we're only willing to obey God when we think we're getting a piece of what we thought would give us satisfaction, but the truth of the matter is it only gave us temporary fulfillment. The text says that she went. She didn't go complaining, but she went in faith. You see, responding in obedience is simply responding in faith because sometimes God will ask us to do some things that our intellectual mind cannot comprehend or do something we cannot see. Paul says, now faith is a substance for things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is believing you can make it even in your most distressing circumstances, even in this pandemic, because of reliance on God. Faith is the evidence of what God will do in your life. Faith is active. It moves forward and it becomes a proof of what God is doing in our life. In order for us to please God with our obedience, we must understand that faith is a crucial element to pleasing the Lord. 
Because the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please him. And sometimes in life, one of our greatest challenges of this Christian faith is learning to live a life without requiring signs in order to move forward. It pleases God seeing us that we're going through this pandemic, but we still stay connected to God. It pleases God seeing us going through situations in life, but we still will stay connected with God. You know, anybody can trust God when things are going the way you want it to go. But can you trust God when everything around you is contradicting on how you want it to turn out? So my question to you today is, can you be faithful to God when all you have is one word or one revelation from God? You see, the only people who need signs are people who don't have faith because when you have faith, hearing is just enough. Because when God makes you a promise, he does not need to give us immediate evidence because evidence is not needed when we have faith because faith is the evidence of things not seen. So since we found out why sometimes it can seem difficult for us to obey God, now how can we obey God consistently? In order for us to obey God consistently, we must understand that gaining God's acceptance must be the most important thing in our life. Acceptance from the Lord is the only thing that should matter. And as long as we're doing what he called us to do, that's good enough. And then next, in order for us to obey God consistently, we cannot meditate on options for disobedience. We cannot consider how can I obey God and recover from the rest. But lastly, in order for us to obey God consistently, it requires bold acts of obedience without complete understanding. Let me say that one more time. It requires bold acts of obedience without complete understanding. In other words, I got to be willing to trust God knows what's best for me. If he tells me to jump, I got to get ready to jump. Because God is not obligated to show me where he's leading me, even though he knows. And it gives us information on a need to know basis. And because of that, we need to be satisfied with what he gives us. We don't need to know all the details, of how everything is going to turn out. We just need to know what step to take next. Because once we take that one step, God is then obligated to show us the next step. But God is not obligated to show us the next step until we walk in the knowledge of what he's already said. Because the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You may say, Rodney, what do you mean about bold acts of obedience and taking those steps? Well, look in John 9, there's a man who was blind from birth and, and Jesus performs this miracle. Jesus spits into mud and puts it on this blind man's eyes and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. He spits in some mud, puts it on the blind man's eyes and tells the blind man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. You missed it. You missed it. He spits into mud and puts mud on a man's eyes who cannot see and tells him to go wash in a pool he cannot see. And the text says he comes back seeing. I don't know about you. That sounds ridiculous to me, but he obeyed the ridiculous and he expected the miraculous. So there's the ridiculous command. There's the ridiculous response in obedience. But lastly, my last observation is the ridiculous miracle. I can, I can, I can preach all day to you, but, but, but as I come to a close, I believe God was going to bless this woman, but he wanted to test and see if she was willing to obey him and her most distressing circumstances. You see, tests are totally different from temptations. According to James chapter one, God does not tempt his people, but he will always test his people. You see, when I was taking my final exam for my master's degree in ministry, I, I was studying about theology and I, and I was nervous about the test and I, I went in and I was ready for the test. And all of a sudden, as I was getting ready to take my test, I just felt this overwhelming presence of God just tell me, Rodney, you don't have to worry about the test because a test is just a survey of what you already know. You just need to trust me. I come to tell you today, my brothers and sisters, all we have to do is trust God in the midst of what we go through. We have to trust God even when it seems ridiculous. You may say, Rodney, how, how is this ridiculous thing really work? Well, let's, let's give you some examples in the Bible. Here's a man by the name of Noah. Noah was commanded by the Lord to build an ark. And he said, there's getting ready to be rain. But there had not been rain. But, but he said, I need you to build an ark. That sounds ridiculous. But he built the ark. 
and it got the miraculous. Here's a man by the name of Abraham and his wife named Sarah. The Lord said, you're going to have a child from your withered old bodies. That's ridiculous. But they obeyed the ridiculous and they got the miraculous. Here's a lame man at the gate called Beautiful. The Bible says the disciples tells him to stand up in the name of Jesus and walk. But standing up, that's ridiculous. He can't walk. But he obeyed the ridiculous and he got the miraculous. Here's Jesus at a wedding and they, they run out of wine and they bring Jesus some water. And, they, and Jesus says, I'm going to turn this water into wine. That seems ridiculous. But they obeyed the ridiculous and they got the miraculous. Here's Peter. Peter's in the boat. There's a storm, but he sees Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, step out on the water. That's ridiculous. But if you obey the ridiculous, you can expect the miraculous. If I can give you a personal one, I, I'm leaving one pastorate to come here at Grace Church to another pastorate in the midst of a pandemic. That's ridiculous. But I obeyed the ridiculous and I'm expecting the miraculous. Even here in this climate that we're in, here's this African-American young preacher who's getting ready to partner with a Caucasian pastor in the midst of this country, getting ready to obey the ridiculous and we're expecting the miraculous. I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that no matter what you're going through, even in this pandemic, when God tells you to do something, obey the ridiculous and you can expect the miraculous. God is able to do everything he said above and beyond more that you can ask or think. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can gather around your word, God. We thank you that even in the midst of this ridiculous uh, uh, season that we're in, we're going to obey you to expect the miraculous. So increase our faith in this season. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.